It's funny, every time I watch the happy birthday Jesus, I just can't believe another year has gone by. Feels like yesterday when my kids would sing that. Remember Cher? It was like yesterday. It's crazy. And then this past week, I had my oldest son come in for a job shadow. He's a senior already. So he job shadowed me to learn what it's like to be a pastor. It's life. Hold on to your kids, Darren. They go so fast. Hold on to them. Don't let them grow up. It's funny, as I was studying with my son, we were, what we did is I showed him how I do sermons. We read through the passage. I kind of get a good idea of where the passage is going, and then I try to find some illustrations to help kind of bring the passage to life. And my son was talking to me. He goes, oh, you know what? This kind of reminds me. Remember that story you told us when you put us to bed? And he gave me a little bit of a clue, and I said, yeah, I remember that story. And so to begin this message, this is really from Joseph, this story. But we would, I have four kids. My name's Chris Weeks. I'm the pastor's church. I have four kids. My oldest daughter got married last year. I've got two sons in high school and one daughter who's a freshman in high school. My oldest daughter, Ginger, I began telling her makeup stories when I put her to bed. I'd take about a half hour, I'd tell her a story, and then she'd go to bed, and I would have to make up a new one every night. She demanded it. So every night I'd tell her a new story. By the time you come around to my sons, I'm running out of stories. I, I just can't think of that many. So I went back in my file and I would tell either books that I read or movies that I saw. And this one movie I told was, uh, was I knew it would fascinate my sons. And here's, how the, and here's how I tell the story. Here's how the story goes. And this is actually leading into the passage perfectly. This story is about a man who was... A castaway, his boat sunk and he was on a lifeboat with two other men and they found this island in the Pacific. Nobody's ever charted this island before and a boat came up on the shoreline and when it came up on the shoreline, they camped out right next to some woods. But in the woods, you could see these eyes that were glowing and they were darting about and they were growling. So the men that night decided to camp close to the water and away from the forest. Well, sure enough, they built a tent, they had a fire, it got dark, and all of a sudden, out of the woods came these two animals. But they weren't any kind of animal. Sure, they had markings like a leopard, and they had teeth and fangs like any normal animal, but they walked on two feet. And they grabbed these two men and dragged them into the woods, never to be seen from again. So one man was left. And he finally fell asleep. When he fell asleep, he too was bound, gagged, and he was dragged through the woods. But this time he was taken to a lodge that had a laboratory and he was chained to this laboratory bed. And he woke up and this guy with a beard looked down at him and he said, hello, my name is Dr. Moreau. This is my island. The name of the story is the island of Dr. Moreau. If you know it, it's kind of a creepy story, but my kids loved it. Anyhow, I kept going. And he said, you have no right to trespass my island. And he said, what were those things out in the woods? He said, well, I'll tell you. I'm doing experiments on the animals. I'm taking human DNA, genome, and I'm pumping it into their arms. I'm turning animals into human beings. And I'm becoming more and more successful. And then his servant walked in, and he kind of walked like that. And he looked, looked like an ape, but he was a man. He said, yes, that's one of my prime patients, but I'm getting better at this. Well, basically, the story kept going. It turned out where not only did he turn animals into men, he would rule over them by taking them to a room of pain and torture them, and it was a really exciting story. And he's torching these animals, and the guy's like, we got to get out of here, and he fell in love with another one of his servants, this beautiful lady. They decided to leave the island, and Dr. Moreau found out. He chained them to the bed again, but he pumped him full of animal DNA, and he's going to turn him into a tiger, and he's transforming And they finally got out, they got on a boat, and they got off the island, torched the island. The island went up in flames. Dr. Moreau's experiences went up in flames, experiments. And then there's this giant boat came to rescue him. And the the serum was wearing off, so the man who was a tiger was turning back into a man. And then when he turned to his this lady he's with, she started getting fangs. Then I said, Good night, have a nice night. My kids went to bed. I wonder why my kids never fell asleep too well, but those are the kind of stories. Now, that's the story my son said. This is sort of 
This passage is sort of like the story of the island of Dr. Moreau where beasts are turned into humans. And there's one scene in the book where he looks at the eyes of this beast after it gets the DNA, the human DNA is put into him. And he says, when I look into his eyes, that which once was an animal is now trying to think. And the idea of this next passage is we are going to talk about animals that are being turned into not just humans, but a step higher. And we're going to see what that's all about. So turn to Titus, chapter 2, verse 15 to 3, 7. And the title of this message is The Island of Dr. Numa. Not Moreau, but Numa. And if you are a Greek scholar, you should know what that is. We will find out about that in just a minute. So we are in Titus chapter 2, verse 15. Verse 15. Paul writes to Titus, Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no one. To avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, it starts off in chapter 2, verse 15. Actually, it's a new paragraph starting in verse 15. And it's kind of a, what I'd call an umbrella verse, which gives you how you should perceive the rest of these verses. So Paul is writing to Titus, and he's saying to Titus in verse 15, declare these things, meaning tell the people in the church these things, exhorting them, that means exhortation isn't just teaching, it's telling you to do this. Don't just learn this, do this. And then it says, rebuking them, that's where you're saying you're doing the wrong thing, you need to change. And then he says with all authority. So t Paul's saying, Timothy, or Titus, I give you all, uh, all the authority to be the leader, teach. And then he says, let no one disregard you. So chapter, I mean, chapter 2, verse 15 is saying, Everything we're going to say from this point on is serious. It's serious. It's to be taken with what I would say sobriety and earnestness. Do this. When I was reading a commentator, um, one commentator writes, Christian behavior in contemporary society was of utmost importance because what this is about is how we behave. And he's saying it was of utmost importance for the furtherance of the gospel. Meaning, the gospel is not just about what you say, it's how you live. It's how you live. Not just how you live, but I think it's the prime ingredient for the gospel sticking. Often, uh, my oldest daughter, Ginger, would say, I'm just a terrible evangelist at high school. I said, what do you mean? I'm not good at arguing. I'm not good at going up to people and asking them about the gospel. I said, how are you, Ginger? At living it. Because that's your job right now in the high school is to live it. That comes first. Another way to put it is this. Is you can say it like this. Go ahead and hit that. Jesus followers should not act like animals. If you Raise your hand if you claim to be a follower of Jesus. Just raise your hand. Okay, most of you are. Very good. I was hoping, for, I was really hoping for that. Now listen to what 1 John says in chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. Whoever says, I know him, and those of you who raised your hand, a Jesus follower is a person who says, I know him. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. 
Verse 5. Whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. Meaning if you do what this says, God's love lives in you. And then it goes on by saying this. By this we may know that we are in him. How do we know we are in him? Verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him, follows him, is a Christian. Whoever says he follows him ought to walk the same way Jesus walked. In other words, Jesus' followers should not act like animals, but you should walk the way Jesus walks. So how does he walk? That's what we're going to talk about in Titus 3. He's going to be very specific. I'm going to talk about instead of being animals, we need to be civilized people, people that look like Christ. So first we're going to talk about what a civilized person looks like. And in here, he's going to talk about what you're to look like in public life, that means out with others, and what you're supposed to look like in private. This is a very simple passage. It's not deep at all, but it's hard. Here's what we're supposed to be like in public. Verse 1, he says, Titus, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. To be obedient and to be ready for every good work. So in other words, if you're going to be civilized, if you're going to walk like Jesus walks, be submissive to authorities. And by authorities, it means civil administration. That includes the police, the law, school system if you're in school, teachers, parents are authorities, government officials. Pay your taxes. It's just simple community stuff. Do good things for other people. Apparently, I was doing some research. The Cretans, this is, remember, written to the people on the island of Crete. Cretans were known for political agitation. They wanted something. They would burn houses. They would kill their leaders. Actually, if you go to some third world countries, one of the ways they change leadership is by having coups where they just riot and they kill the next person in leadership. That was going on in Crete. Actually, if you look at some of the news, the economic situation in Greece right now is so bad, there's just massive rioting going on all the time. The riot is for the purpose of using mob power as leverage over the political leaders. Paul says, don't do that. Be submissive. In fact, in 1 Peter, Peter says, you know when you're mistreated by your employer, by the government, be like Christ, where Jesus didn't even open his mouth when he was crucified on the cross. And then it says he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So if you're mistreated, if you feel you're wrong, don't riot. Trust God. I think that was even if you do, you do have a voice as a citizen, but be more like Martin Luther King Jr., who believed nonviolence was the way to change policy and law, not violence and mobbing and anger. Violence only creates violence. Jesus says, and trust yourself to him who judges justly. That's public. So in public, be a good citizen. Be submissive. In private, look at verse 2. This is tough. This is so hard. Verse 2 is one of these verses that we read. You'll never pick it as your memory verse. You just, you just go past it. You fly by it. But if you stop on it, put on your brakes, soak in it, oh, this is hard. Verse 2. Speak evil of no one. Avoid quarreling. Be gentle. Show perfect courtesy towards all people. This is tough. So let's begin in private. The idea is... Your words matter. Stop venting. Stop letting people have it. That's not the way of Christ. In other words, other versions say avoid slander. Don't slander people. If you, look at, if you follow my notes, on the back side you'll see study notes. Number four has this quote. If you have it, open your bulletin, look at my study notes, and look at number four on the back side. Because it describes what slander is or is should not be. The definition of slander is to use your words to damage others while you are making yourself look good. That's the point of slander. 
you're damaging something, somebody, so you look better. So here's what the quote says. According to this verse, our tongue should never utter anything which we know to be false about someone else. How do you do on that? Say things that will do another person, do not say things that will do another person wrong in any way. Never exaggerate the facts to make us look better. Don't make the bad traits of another person prominent, meaning don't point out how bad they are all the time. And then the last one is, it's not in the notes, but I wrote it down, and pass over, don't pass over what is good in them. We have a tendency to always talk bad, never exalt the person's good traits. This is hard. I mean, seriously, we could just stop here and say, go home and do this. Do you do this? I don't. I got to change. Like when I read this, I'm like, I got to change. Then it says here, be gentle, show perfect courtesy towards all people. So that means show deference to other people. Courtesy isn't just for the waitress that the restaurant you're going to, courtesy is for all of you to show courtesy to each other, to show deference for each other. Philippians says, treat other people better than yourself. I found five ways that you can show deference. Listen to this. This is another one of those things like, this is bad preaching because you're talking about my life. Quit meddling. Just get on to heavy theology. That's good preaching. Don't talk about this. First one, courtesy is when you meet someone for the first time, Your job should be to learn about who they are. Get to know them. Don't make it about yourself. Number two, showing courtesy means when you are in disagreement, before leveling your side of the argument, try to understand the other person's side so well you can repeat it back to them. Normally when we argue, we don't listen. We just argue. This is saying if I'm going to show deference, I need to know your side so well I can repeat it back to you. Third thing. Showing deference is when you are discussing ideas and issues, let those who have the experience and age have the first say. We live in a youth culture, so youth don't really like to listen to older people. Most of us don't. We don't want to give them the time. This is saying, courtesy is saying, Recognize who has the experience, who has the knowledge. Let them speak first. Learn. Number four, when people are sharing their lives, let them be the experts at their experiences. This is something my dad always taught me. He was an incredible football player in college. But when I played football, he always asked me about, what is this play? How do you get better? I said, Dad, you're the college player. He goes, Chris, I've never walked in your shoes. I want to learn from you. Learn from other people. Stop being, asking opinions of other people so you can answer your own question. A lot of people do that. What did you think of that? You went to the picture rocks. How did you like it? Well, I, well you should have been there when I was there. <laughs> we, we have a tendency to get in a conversation so we can answer our own question. Ask a question without having an answer for it. Just listen. That's called deference. And then number five, When people say or do something that may be rude or offensive to you, don't take offense. A lot of times people don't know they're being offensive. Don't take offense. A wise man looks past insults. That's courtesy. Have you ever been with somebody and you say something, you don't know what you say, but they'll never talk to you again? Courtesy is don't take offense. So those five things is what I found to be showing deference. That's what a civilized person does. That's what Christ did. But as I read this list, I'll have to be honest with you, I asked, if I take this list seriously, I'm going to be a wimpy person. I'm going to be a wimp. It's wimpy. I want to take def. I don't want to show deference. I want to let people have it, you know? Americans, they take charge. They let their power be known. They're bold. Why do I have to be this wimpy Sit and take the back seat. Let others go before. Why do I got to be like that? Because that's how Jesus was. 
And, and we've been saved from the being animals. Look at what he says in verse 3. Verse 3 is harsh. Actually, Paul is really hard. He said, here's the reason why you've got to act like verse 1 and 2 because you used to be. Verse 3, and it says, for we, we ourselves, meaning all of us, that's a plural word, including the whole people, including you, we ourselves were at one time foolish. We were all fools. This is a hard word. Actually, if you go in the book of Proverbs and look up the word fools and what not to be, a fool is somebody you don't want to be. One of the key qualities of a fool, according to Proverbs, is he delights in airing his own opinions. Just talks, 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 doesn't listen. And I think that's why verse 2 is so important, showing courtesy, deference. But listen to the definition of a fool. A fool is, person, is a person who's thoughtless, intellectually negligent or reckless, failing to think responsibly about a matter, having no sense, implying one should have known better. It is not so much a lack of education or intelligence or mental capacity. Foolishness is the lack of mental consideration. Oh, I was like that before I knew Christ. I didn't listen too much. I was trying, I, uh, I've told this story to a number of people. It might make sense to some of you, but the first service when I used it, people like, I really don't get the illustration, but it makes sense to me. I remember I went to a Tom Petty concert. And Tom Petty, if you know Tom Petty, he just actually just died. He sang classic rock. He's skinny. looks like a skeleton. Had a long, big top hat. And he'd kind of sway and he'd sing like that, you know. And I went to one of his concerts with my buddies. And we're waiting for him to come out on stage. There's probably 20,000 people in the audience. It's packed. He comes out on stage. And I'm talking to my friend, but Tom Petty said something. And the place went wild, like crazy wild. They're high-fiving everybody. Everybody's clapping, going, woo! And I said, man, what did Tom Petty say? And my friend said, man, you know what he said? He said, hello, Cleveland. <laughs> That's all he said? Yeah, man, he knows where he's at. He's in Cleveland. <laughs> Thinking, what? Like, and, I, and I started waking up saying, these are my mind-numb zombie friends like he can say any he could tell us to eat garbage and we probably eat it you know we just don't think that's a fool i just felt like i was a fool i don't know how, like chris wake up man quit clapping for the skeleton up there because he knows what city he's in it's nuts i don't know how to explain it but I, that's when i began waking up to what do i think what do i, do I listen you know if you talk to a non-christian and a non-Christian does not agree with Christianity, usually they have two reasons why, and to me they're non-thinking reasons. I'll go up to a person. I think they catch this in the air somehow. You talk to a non-Christian, why aren't you a Christian? Well, because that Bible you read, man, it's full of contradictions. Okay, what are the contradictions? And do you know what a contradiction is, by the way? Well, I don't know, man, it's just full of contradictions. Well, what are they? I don't know. I just heard that somewhere. That's foolish. Another one is, there are all a bunch of hypocrites in the church. Who's not a hypocrite? So non-Christians aren't hypocrites? Everybody's a hypocrite. That's, a, that's, a, that's an argument that makes, it's like just a smoke screen. We're all like that. Before we were saved, we just went along with the crowd. But this says we were even worse than that. We were animals. Watch what it keeps saying. This is what we were like. It says, we weren't just foolish, but we were disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. So it talks about what we're like in public and what a person's like in private before Christ comes into them. In public, we have this tendency to want to be disobedient. We want to be rebellious. We want to fight. We want to be our own man. In public, beasts rebel. Beasts like to be known as contrarians and anarchists. Their motto is simple. No one, and I mean no one's going to tell me what to do. And if, I, if they try, I'm going to go down fighting. You know, America's a free country. Don't tell me what to do. It's just the heart of the beast. 
You can't tame it. Psalm 2, why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot in vain, and they say, we're going to take off God's chains. Then it says the one in heaven mocks or laughs at them. There's this desire to be on my own. I had this kid in my class. I tell my kids about him at dinner. His name was Ted. Ted just, he just liked to make authorities mad at him. He joined the football team just so he could make coaches mad. We'd be doing calisthenics. He'd stand up and he'd say some giant swear word. The coach would say, what? That's right, I said that. Go run. <laughs> so what's wrong with that kid? He didn't make it on the team too long. But it, it's just that heart. It's just weird. My dad would say about my brother sometimes growing up, he, he lived life hard. He made life hard. Rebels make life hard. They just do. The best way to tell if you're a rebel, and by the way, rebels are the cool thing in movies, but in real life they're, they're a nightmare to be around. The best way to tell if you're a, a rebel is when you're, you learn by, ex, by doing instead of learning by listening. You have to experience it before you'll believe it. You won't take, take advice and wisdom. Uh, Ken Rudolph used to say, you can tell the difference between a smart person and a wise person. If you tell a smart person, you know, if you take that handsaw and go over your hands, it'll cut off the fingers. Don't do that. A smart person will put his hand there and go, let me try. Zoom. Oh, you're right. I won't ever do that again. Yeah, but you'll never have those fingers back. A wise person's like, all right, I'll listen. A beast doesn't like to learn from others. That's how you can tell. So in private, in private, what are they like? Well, it says they are slaves to passion. Passion means feelings, emotions, what I want, and it rules over them. The animal believes they deserve to get what they want. So they're right. I want to show you something very interesting. Go to Psalm 37.4. I'll show you how they... I'll show you how the beast reads this verse and the civilized person reads this verse. This is a cool verse. But it, how you interpret it kind of reveals who you are. Psalm 37, 4. One little verse. It says, Delight yourself in the Lord. Psalm 37, 4. It's so good to hear those pages turn, Jared. Man, that's Jared's favorite noise. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So a civilized person reads it in context. I first delight myself in the Lord. If the Lord is my delight, that means he, that's what my heart wants. So if I delight myself in the Lord, I will want not just the Lord, but the things the Lord wants. If I want the things the Lord wants, I can pray for anything and I'll get it. So a civilized person realizes I, it's all about loving God first. A beast hears, you know what the Scripture says? He'll give you the desires of your heart. So I'm going to pray for a house, a mansion, a lot of money. I'm going to pray for that. And he's going to give it to me because it says right there, he gives you the desires of your heart. That's passion. It's sort of like this guy wanted to ask his fiancée out or ask his girlfriend to marry him. And it was a snowy Christmas Eve night. He got on his knee, took out a black box, and gave it to her under the Christmas tree. She opened it up, and there was a gleaming diamond ring. She put it on her finger, ran upstairs, threw the box down, went up to her room, closed the door, locked it, went to the mirror, and just stood and stared at the ring. Didn't go downstairs and talk to him anymore. She got what she wanted. Left the fiancé downstairs, wouldn't talk to him. What, a, what kind of a relationship is that? We do that with God all the time. God, I'm going to love you if you give me something. And then he gives it to me and I got what I wanted. But really the issue is the relationship. The beast doesn't understand that, nor does he want it. And then the end of it in Titus 3 says, what does the beast run on? What does is, what is he run on? 
he responds to pleasure, but he runs on hate. Passing our days in malice. This is back to Titus 2, verse 3. Passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. The beast hates. The beast gets jealous. The beast wants what you have. Before I was a Christian, I'll just be honest with you, I had a conviction. It's really weird, but I just am going to tell you what I, because I, I try to go back and think what I was like as a beast, and I can remember what I was like. As a beast, I had this conviction that the world was out to get the white male. It's out to get him. I wouldn't get a job, and I'd say, see, they're out to get the white guy. My heart would see... War between men and women, white and blacks, rich and poor, America's versus the world. If some, someone had something I wanted, I would be jealous or I would pout. When my friends got a high-paying job, I would wonder why I didn't. When I'd see somebody my age driving a car that was expensive, I would go on a vacation I wanted to go on, I would be so jealous. I'd be, it'd be inside of me, this anger. I wouldn't, I'd just stuff it, but it would rule me. And so the question for you is, what, what makes you angry? Do you know a lot of times anger at those kind of things means I really don't trust God. I don't believe he's got my best interest at heart. It's not faith. Jealousy is not faith. Do you rejoice in other people's success? Or do you wonder and moan why it isn't yours? The beast gets angry and pouts because they're ruled by hate. So, you have the civilized person and you have the beast. And God wants us to stop living like the beast and start becoming like a civilized, glory-giving human being. Why? Well, look what it says in verse 4 and 5. But when the goodness, the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration or new of the Holy Spirit. That word saved means literally delivered from. So the idea is that he delivered us from ourselves. So we often say, see in verse 4 where it says, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, that word appeared when he came, we often say the reason for the season is Jesus. That's true, but that's not the full truth. Jesus came as a little baby to change you. To transform you out of an animal into a real human being again. That's why he came. He saved us. He delivered us. He rescued us. So the question, somebody answer that. Answer that now. I'll go crazy. I'm kidding. Makes me, is that you, John? No. Nate, is that you? Nate? No, I'm kidding. He saved us means he delivered us. The question everybody has. This is probably number one question when you go to church. How does a man get saved? How does a person make it to heaven? What's ironic, this talks a little bit about it. The whole gist of this passage is he saved us to transform us, because you'll see verse 7. But in there, he tells us quickly how we get saved. It's not hard. That's the irony. It's not hard. And he tells us what doesn't save us, and he tells us what does save us. And so he begins by saying what doesn't save us. He says, not because of works done by us in righteousness. In other words, we're not saved just because we dressed up the beast. Just because we put a top hat and it has a cane and gloves and a nice suit on the beast, that doesn't save you. We call that religion. Religion is putting a top hat on the beast. See, I go to church. I pay my tithe. I wear a robe. I talk a new way. It's dressing up the beast. The beast isn't an outward problem. It's a heart problem. It's a heart problem. I can dress up a bear, but he still bites me. It's a heart problem. It's who I am on the inside. Human philosophy says do good to be good. If I do good, if I do enough good, I'll be good. No, you first need to be good to do good. Jesus is so clear, and he's so simple. Listen to what he says. A evil tree cannot produce 
good fruit. It's so simple. Here's what he's saying. Inside that tree, the DNA of a tree, it will only, if it's a bad tree, it will only produce bad fruit. You can't tape good apples on a bad tree. It doesn't make it a good tree. If I take a peach tree, I can't make an apple tree by pasting on apples. I first have to be an apple tree in order for apples to sprout from me. That's the whole point of you're not saved by works of righteousness. The word righteousness means obey, obedience to the Jewish law. It doesn't save you. Okay, then what saves me? It's very simple. His mercy. He looks down on me as an animal and his heart breaks. And so he says, I want to change him because I love him. Because I am love. Love loves. God is love. And because he's love, he loves. Love responds to changing that which is rotten to make it brand new. His heart is moved towards the beast. Look at this verse. Go to the next. It says, turn, O Lord. This is in Psalm 6, verse 4. Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. That's the same word for save. Deliver. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. Save me for the sake of your mercy. So when he saves me, I can't believe it. When I'm different, I can't believe it. And I realize it's not me, it's him. And I fall in love with his love. It's ironic, it's a Trinitarian love. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 is talking about God the Father. When the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of works done in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renew of the Holy Spirit. So you have the Father, the Spirit, in verse 6. And he poured out the Spirit through Jesus Christ, the Son. This is a Trinitarian love. But it's for the sake of his mercy. Daniel 9 prays, God, hear my prayers. For your sake, not because of my righteousness, but for your sake. That's why we pray. Because God did it. I often, like if, let's say you have somebody in your family who doesn't know the Lord. And you want them to know the Lord. And you go to prayer and say, I don't know how to pray. Here's how you pray. It's very simple. Say, God, you are compassionate. You're full of love. Look upon the person I love with your love and save them. And I, I am calling you to account by your love. I can hold God accountable. I can hold God to his word on who he is. He's love. And if I appeal to him based on love, he will love to answer that prayer because when my loved one's saved, I can go to God and say, thank you, you are faithful to who you are. He saves based on who he is. So how does he do it? How does he save? He does two things. And it's through the work of, according to verse 5, the Holy Spirit. The Greek word for spirit is pneuma. So I'm going to call this the island of Dr. Numa because when a spirit comes on me, he injects me with himself. And his injection of himself changes me. And he does this two ways. And he uses the word regenerates. That means he pours new life into me, washing of regeneration. So we use the word born again. When I believe, he breathes new life into me. Regeneration. And... Renewal, that means this new life now starts working from the inside to change me. If you combine both of these words together, it's synonymous with the word resurrection. Resurrection is a dead man who God brings to life, that's regeneration, and doesn't leave him in the same state as he was when he died. He makes him new, brand new. He reforms him into his image. That's called resurrection. It's a brand new thing. So he first acts upon us by washing us with his spirit, and then he renews us on the inside. And when you combine all these together, regeneration, renewal, resurrection, theologians call this metamorphosis. You might have heard of the phrase metamorphosis. It's when you have a caterpillar. He sits on a branch. And all of a sudden, he comes out as a butterfly. That butterfly is not the same thing as the caterpillar. Not only is it more beautiful, but it's different. 
and species. When God's Spirit comes on me, I'm different. I'm different. The old beast that lived in Chris Weeks, the old animal, is a new man. I was talking actually to Derek about this. And Derek and I were talking about the moment when you get saved. And, I was, and Derek knows my story. I was saved on this State Route 44 in Ohio. And it was a two-hour process where my life was crashing in on me. I asked God to forgive me. And I can remember telling God, you can take my life and do whatever you want with it. Even if you want to kill me, it's yours. And from that moment, I know I'm different. I knew I was completely different. I was dead. And you know, you know resurrection always comes after death, by the way. I was dead, and he brought me brand new. It's a metamorphosis. I saw the change. And then it says in verse 6 that this change isn't just some small sprinkling. It's a pouring. When he poured out on us richly, Jesus poured out on us richly. He wants us to be so different. He doesn't just sprinkle us. He saturates us with his life. We just can't help it. We're different. You just can't help it. Instead of taping apples to the tree, they just start popping out. Love, joy, peace, patience, pop, pop, pop. Goodness, kindness, self-control. It just comes out of you, this new fruit. You're different. You're different. Why? What is the purpose? Why does he do this? Verse 7 is the crescendo. This is the whole purpose. And you got to take it slow. It's amazing. Read it slow with me. This is, let this sink in because I don't think you believe this. I'm not sure we believe this. Why does he change us? Why does he wash us? Why does he renew us? Why does he regenerate us? Why does he pour out us richly the Holy Spirit through Christ? Verse 7, so that being justified by His grace, that's His mercy. It's not based on us. We are at peace with God through what He did so that being justified by His grace, we might become, so here it is. Here's the point. Here's the whole purpose. We might become heirs. Do you know what an heir is? It's a person who is royalty, who is son and daughter and who rules with his father or her father, the king. An heir is somebody who is privy to the intimate relationship with the father. It's a person who's been adopted and will never lose their standing. An heir owns everything the father owns. It's mine. So everything Jesus and God owns becomes mine. It's just incredible. Listen, listen how Philippians 3, 20 and 21 say it. Our citizenship, meaning we're no longer animals, we have been brought into a new city, our citizenship is in heaven. He will transform our lowly body, the beast, this beastly body, to be like his glorious body, one of royalty, a prince, a princess. By the power, that's Dr. Numa, the Holy Spirit, by the power that enables him. So we are no longer animals. We just aren't. So what does this mean, this whole idea of being transformed to be an heir? I don't have any idea. I don't. Like, it, really what it says, here's Nate. Here's how C.S. Lewis put it. C.S. Lewis said, if I can see Nate Thompson as you are going to be in heaven right now, I would want to bow down and worship you, you're going to be so amazing as a new creature. You know what Charles Spurgeon says? With our new bodies, he thinks we'll be able to grab a tree by the trunk and just rip it out of its roots because we're going to be immortal, invincible. What is that going to be look like? I don't know, but the question is, do you believe that? I don't think we believe that. The reason why is we keep jumping in the same sewage we always have. We still get depressed. We still, everything stinks. But here's what I do know what it means to be transformed. 
What you see now is not what we will be. Yesterday, my wife and daughter took some flour. They took some sugar, some salt, some vanilla, and they made this glob of dough. It's that, you know, you taste it. It tastes really good, but it goes to your belly and it, ugh. But they took this glob of dough. They put it on a table that had flour on it. They rolled it out. Then they took a cookie cutter and they pressed it hard and they put it on a pan and they baked it for a little bit. It came out golden brown. They put some colored icing on it, some sparkles and sprinkles. And that new thing is nothing like that glob of dough it was before. I don't know how that happens, but that new thing is amazing. God is going to take me, this animal, and he, through the power of his spirit, is going to mash me down, roll me out, He's going to take this cookie cutter that is called the conformity into the likeness of Christ, and he's pressing that right now. I don't see what it is, but through the Spirit, he's baking me. He's baking me, and he's making me different. And when I finally see what I'm going to be, it's going to be like nothing that this just glob of dough is like right now. God is going to take a piece of human clay that was once angry and nasty and he's going to transform it by the Spirit. Dr. Numa. So I'm no longer an animal. I was telling my kids of another story. In the 1980s, right around the same time the island of Dr. Moreau came out, there's another movie that came out. And this was a movie I saw with my brother, and I'll never forget it. Some of you might have heard of it, but it's called The Elephant Man. It came out in the 1980s. Black and white movie. It's about this guy that had elephantitis on his skull, which made his skull all deformed. Big lumps on the front, big lump on the back. His mouth was all twisted. He had like a hook on his hand, and he walked like this. And people couldn't understand what he said because he's kind of deformed. And so he's in a freak show. People would laugh at him and mock him. But down deep inside of him was this gentleman, this brilliant man. But he was so deformed, people just laugh at him. Well, one, one scene, it's the most it's the classic scene. He's at a train station, and he knows how deformed he is and how hideous he is, so he put this white cloth over his head, cut out two holes, and put on a hat so he could walk through the train station so nobody would notice him. But he couldn't walk fast. He walked like this. And some rowdy kids were noticing some guy in a mask walking by, so they started throwing paper at him and spitballs at him and laughing at him. So he started going faster, but when he went faster, he knocked over a little girl, and her mom screamed, and everybody thought he's this monster running through. And so they cornered him in the back of this train station. All kind of people were there. And one guy took off his, his, his mask, his cloth, and out came this hideous guy. His eyes, different places, his head's all out, his hair's all like that. And he's like that, and everybody's just shocked by him, and they're ready to beat him. And he says, I am not an animal. I am not an animal. I am not an animal. Sometimes in your day when lust comes in, or your friends want you to be an idiot, or you get, you get angry and hate people, you need to allow the Spirit to say, I am not an animal. I'm a child of God. Act like it. I am not an animal. Live like you are an heir who is being transformed day by day because you've been washed. You've been renewed. You've been loved by Christ that he poured out his love upon your heart by the Holy Spirit who's given unto us. So we are not animals.